It is now about four after six. We'll go ahead and start the meeting today, call it to order. And as a reminder, uh, if you'd like to speak to the, uh, and submit a public comment, please email the city clerk's office at cityclerk at eastvillecagovernor or by utilizing the raise your hand function and go to webinar to speak at the meeting. Uh, during the comment uh, time, the clerk will call your name and unmute you. Staff will monitor emails to the extent possible during the meeting and provide comments as possible. Uh, our lobby is also open, is that right? Correct. So we still have comment cards in the back? Yes, sir. Oh, I will get them. Okay, no problem. So we also have comment cards if you'd like to, if you're going to be in person and would like to uh, submit a public comment, you can uh, hand the, the uh, card completed to the city clerk. So Stephanie, could we start roll call? Commissioner Cirillo? Here. Commissioner Fitch? Here. Commissioner Brella? Here. Vice Chair Gracia? Here. Chair Dinko? Here. Thank you. And our Pledge of Allegiance tonight, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Varela. Thank you. For, so tonight we'll start off uh, item four for presentations and announcements. Uh, we'll start with the introduction of Riverside County Sheriff Lieutenant Mark Boyd. I'll introduce Lieutenant Mark Boyd. He has uh, 25 years of law enforcement experience, 21 of which are with Riverside County Sheriffs. He's held assignments in corrections, patrol, special teams and community services, Sheriff's Administration and the Regional Gang Task Force. Lieutenant Boyd has worked in the contract cities of Temecula and Moreno Valley and most recently worked at Lake Elsinore, where he managed a law enforcement contract for the city of Lake Elsinore. Lieutenant Boyd is a U.S. Army veteran and holds a bachelor's degree from Southern, Uni Southern Illinois University. He's married with three children and a city mayor. Hello. Or standing mayor. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman and uh, Commissioners and city staff and uh, residents and guests. It's my pleasure to be here. I look forward to uh, partnering with you guys in the future. And after the meeting offline, I'll be happy to give you my uh, cell phone. Thank you very much. And we also have another introduction at item 4.2, the introduction of Cal Fire Battalion Chief, Josh Jansen. Good evening, commissioners. I, I will uh, introduce Chief Jansen tonight. Chief Jansen, could you stand? Uh... So Chief Jansen began his fire service career in 1993 with the Riverside County Fire Department slash CDF in Cala Mesa as a volunteer firefighter. In 1994, he accepted a job as a firefighter with the U.S. Forest Service on the San Bernardino National Forest. He was hired with CDF then in 1998 as a firefighter in the San Bernardino unit. In 2001, he promoted to Firefighter 2 in the Riverside unit. In 2002, Josh returned to the San Bernardino unit, City of Highland as a Firefighter 2 paramedic, and then promoted to Fire Apparatus Engineer paramedic in 2004. In 2007, he was promoted to fire captain on a state-funded Schedule B engine in the city of Highland where he worked for the next two years. He was then assigned to the Schedule A Municipal Fire Protection Program where he heavily, was heavily involved in the EMS and training programs with the cities of Highland and Yucaipa. In 2011, Josh transferred to the Riverside unit and assumed a position as a training captain in the training bureau. In 2015, Josh promoted to battalion chief assigned to the Riverside Training and Safety where he was responsible for overseeing the unit's training safety programs. In 2017, he transferred back to the San Bernardino unit uh, for, for two years in the city of Highland. Josh has extensive experience in fire control, SART team safety, state fire training programs. Josh is on a number of CAL FIRE and state fire training cadres and committees, including being a technical panel member with UL slash NIST. He has also been a member of CAL FIRE's incident management team six since July since 2015 and is currently Team Six, one of Team Six's incident commander trainees. 
Josh is a father of three children, Ryan, 14, Jet, 12, and Pace, 8, as well as a husband of 17 years to Natalie Jansen. He was born and raised in the city of Yucaipa, where he attended and graduated from Crafton Hills College with an associate's degree in fire service and EMS. He is currently working on his bachelor's degree in fire administration. So pretty lengthy background on old, old Chief Jansen there. And uh, I, I read that, and I know it took just a second, but I read it with great pride. Uh, Josh and I have been colleagues for a long time. Um, he has a twin brother, Josh, or excuse me, Ron, who works in the San Bernardino unit. Um, our, our experience has is, is been in, in all disciplines in the fire service. I'm very proud to have Josh here as our colleague, and I'll turn it over to Josh here in just a second. But I assure you, along with our law enforcement friends, all of the uh, residents of uh, the city of Eastvale should sleep well at night, knowing Chief, Chief Jansen is on duty with battalion coverage. So I welcome Chief Battalion Chief Josh Jansen to the city of Eastvale. Josh? Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to the city of Eastville. Moving right along, we'll move on to the monthly police department update with item 4.4 provided by Sergeant Gutierrez. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. The police report for the month of May we had a total of 1,904 calls for service, which was an 11% increase from the previous month. Out of those calls for service, we had 45 traffic collisions, which was a 36% increase from the previous month. Out of those traffic collisions, we had six uh, injury, which was a 20% increase, or it was one last month we had five, this month we had six. Uh, um, Non-injury traffic collisions, we had 39, which was a 39% increase from the previous month. Total citations, as you can see, we started, uh, as we saw, we're coming out of the COVID. We started citing more. We wrote 358 citations, which was uh, 326 more than the previous month. Out of those citations, we wrote 321 moving citations, which was an increase of 312. Out of the parking violations, we wrote 37, which was a 60% increase from the previous month. Vehicle burglaries, we had a total of 15 in the month of May, which was a 21% decrease from the previous month. Calls for service re regarding uh, 415 noises, noise calls, we had 100, which was a 53% increase from the previous month. We had um, 16 reported mail thefts, which was an increase of 14 from the previous month. Out of the uniform crime report for the month of April, we had zero reported homicides, zero rapes, zero robberies, two aggravated assaults, 11 burglaries, 57 larceny thefts, 14 vehicle thefts, and zero arson. And for the month of May, the UCR stats aren't available at this, at this time. We had five calls of service related to street racing in the month of May also. I'm available for any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman, looks like we may have skipped uh, item 4.3, the fire update. I did, I apologize. I almost skipped it entirely. Thank you for catching that. Well, we'll get it now then. Uh, item 4.3, the monthly fire update by Chief Mike. Sorry, Chief. All good, all good. Uh, again, good evening, commissioners. For the month of June, a total of, I'm sorry, month of May, a total of 227 calls for service. Um, I'd like to highlight, so knowing our call load is down because of the, the COVID event that's going on. So for the month of May, 227 calls. We went back one year ago, 275 calls. So you can see our calls have significantly trended down with the COVID situation. And then back five years, 179 calls within the city for the month of May. So I anticipate when uh, 
hopefully at some point we get back to normal operations, we can expect that call load to go back up. And then uh, to highlight our call load for the month of May, 23 false alarms, 173 medical aid calls, three other fires, three other miscellaneous, five public service calls, two standby calls, 16 traffic collisions, one vehicle fire, and two wildland fires for a total of 227. Uh, two other items I have for you this evening. I'd like to draw attention to our, our, our fire marshal section within, the, within our fire protection here in the city of Eastville. Several, uh, a month or so ago approximately, we presented our proposal to add half of a fire inspector to start an annual business inspection program here in the city of Eastville. We were very grateful for your support. The city council also uh, supported it and approved it. So we're in the process uh, on or about or after July 1, we will move forward with hiring that half inspector. And then I wanna assure you, we will, we will make sure we cover all grounds of working with the community, working with Gina and her staff to make sure we have a significant public outreach uh, we, we don't want to surprise the community with a new program, but making sure we ease into that program and we provide a good service to the city and ultimately keep everybody safe. So we look forward to that. And then the last item I have for you this evening, uh, many of you have seen it before and I'll, I'll hold it up. It's the uh, ongoing campaign, uh, Children Drown Without a Sound, Knowing the ABCs of Pool Safety. I'll touch on them briefly. We've shared uh, the flyer with city staff uh, we, we push it out every year, and we're looking for everyone to help distribute it. Uh, city staff will help us distribute it, but the campaign, Children Drown Without a Sound, Knowing the ABCs of Pool Safety, and the A is Adult Supervision, Assign a Water Watcher, B is Barriers, C is Classes, CPR, the last portion is What Do I Do If a, a Child Falls Into a Pool? All that information is available on the, on the Cal Fire Riverside County Fire website. And if I could take just a second, not only as your, your local division chief, my law enforcement counterparts, Chief Jensen over there, uh, not only as fire service and law enforcement, but as, as first responders across the world, uh, as parents, we all have an obligation to ensure no children drown in a, in a pool and everything we can do to be proactive and prevent any more drowning. So I thank you for your support on that and uh, end the report unless there's any questions. You might have said this in the past, but what's a standby call? Standby call. So something related to if we had power lines down, natural gas leak like we had uh, earlier in the week over Archibald and River, something that would require the fire engine to be on standby for some type of fire event. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report. All right, we'll move it on now to the uh, monthly community enhancement and safety update provided by uh, our manager, Tafer. Thank you. Uh, during the last month, we responded to 201 different code violations. 180 of those were based on a complaint. 21 of them were proactive, meaning the officer saw the violation and took action on it. Uh, the highlights of those property maintenance was the lion's share with 48, uh, things like good grass is turning brown because it's getting warmer and the weeds are growing and uh, things like that. Uh, the second one was parking violations for recreational vehicles. There was 28 of those. Abandoned vehicles, 22. Junk and view, 22. Um, and illegal dumping, 10. And uh, smaller, much smaller numbers after that. And uh, the source of those complaints is I already covered that proactive and complaint based. But um, 114 are neighbor complaints. One from the police department. That's usually a grow house. Uh, a couple of them, 60 of them were anonymous, um, and a few of them were from, uh, were routed through the city council. They're not the city council complaining, but they came that way. And that's all I have to report. If you have any questions? I have a question about the e-citizen and graffiti. If I can ask it now, or if you want me to wait till the end. Sure. So, something brought up to me. They put in a e-citizen graffiti complaint, and the response back was that it's on private property, and they have to get a authorization but that was uh, a few weeks ago what's that like, how does that work generally the uh, JCSD responds to those and they have to get the property owner to give them permission to to repaint or get rid of that graffiti 
If the property owner is not willing to do that, and that's usually in the case of a commercial building, then they can uh, refer back to us and we can actually go out there and talk to them because it is a code violation to have that exist on their property. So maybe after me, give me the address. I can follow up on it and make sure that uh, we get that resolved. Okay. We'll talk at the end. Right, Thank you. I have one for you, Johnny, if you, um, yeah. if you don't mind for take a second. Um, I think it was a couple of months ago maybe within the not past six months that uh, I believe we had a citizen that um, um, requested the code enforcement to go by an address there on Berry Hill where um, a gentleman had was working out of his garage on several several vehicles. Um, and I actually didn't take any photos, but I actually was on a jog and saw that um, there was at least four cars, two in the garage, two in the driveway, two out in the street with the hoods open and paper plates. And what caught my attention was the fluids from his um, um, radiator just flowing down the driveway out into the curbside. And so and after, apparently the citizen made me aware that after the cars have, have been moved, there's all kinds of different types of soiled in the streets there. So I don't know if, the, if that particular house you're familiar with, the one on Berry Hill, or um, if any action was taken on that. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with it. I can look it up, though. And again, after the meeting, we can, we can pull that up and make sure that we got that resolved. And should I advise them to create an, another ticket if need be? Uh, anytime they see a violation, if, if the violation was corrected and then it comes back, they, they can create a new ticket, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a question. Is Did we have any uh, illegal vending violations? I didn't show any in our reporting. So um, I know there was one uh, in front of 7-Eleven, but they were compliant. They had a they uh, had a business license and that they were out they were more than three feet away from the they had three feet of sidewalk space available. Okay, Do, don't they have to have a permit in the city? Just a business license. Okay. That's that's the only business registration. And they can't get that without a health permit. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, item five, additions and revisions. The commission may only add an item to the agenda after making a finding that there is a need to take immediate action on the item and the item came to the attention of the agency subsequent to the posting of the agenda. An action, uh, I, an action adding an item to the agenda requires a majority vote of the commission. Um, Stephanie, have we had any staff members request to add an item? No, sir, we have not. Uh, would I, any of my commissioners like to add an item? Uh, no need to vote if we have nothing to add, so we'll move on to the consent calendar. All matters of the consent calendar are considered routine and are to be approved with one motion unless a commissioner, staff member, or a member of the public requests separate action on a specific item. Uh, have we had anybody request to pull an item? No, sir. Uh, public or staff, I'm assuming? No, sir. We have not. Uh, would any of the commissioners like to pull an item? Then we'll need uh, a motion and a second to vote uh, for the to uh, uh, accept the remaining of the consent calendar. I'll motion. I'll second. Commissioner Cerullo? Aye. Commissioner Fitch? Aye. Commissioner Rolla? Aye. Vice Chair Gracia? Aye. Chair Dinko? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. So that would be the end of the consent calendar. And um, let's see here. I will move on to uh, commission business items. We have uh, item 7.1, the safety visioning discussion. I think that's what we have next, uh, provided by Jason Killebrew, um, planning manager. Is that still on for tonight? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, Jason Killebrew, Planning Manager with the City of Eastville. Um, here to present kind of an a overview, but also um, an engagement topic to get your feedback on um, an effort that the City has initiated through the Eastville 2040 plan, which um, is the general plan update 
for the uh, city of Eastville visioning out the next couple of decades. So in the strategic plan, as well as the existing general plan, safety has been identified as, as one of the key goals and topics, um, which is why we're in front of you today. Um, and what we're seeking is um, some input to help us um, in uh, guiding our um, drafting and envisioning for the safety element of the Eastville 2040 plan, which is a required element per state law. So here we have a, a quick video um, that uh, basically gives a basic introduction to what a general plan is. Um, and this is a, a video that um, our communications team put together that's also part of our Engage Eastville um, effort that's connected to the Eastville 2040 plan. We will just move on, um, but what we'll do after the meeting is we'll send you the link to that video so that you guys can see it, because I think it, it's really important um, in kind of figuring out how um, we all fit into the role of, of developing that general plan, whether you're commissioners, members of the public, um, or city staff. So currently we have a general plan as required by state law. And uh, what you see in front of you is excerpts from the general plan, uh, specifically the safety element that identifies um, a series of different topics that um, go into discussion and, and how the general plan is going to um, set goals and policies related to those topics. So the, the uh, third column is the list of those topic areas. Um, and I won't go over them in, in too much um, detail, but essentially um, us being a very young city, um, these topics were inherited from the county of Riverside. Um, so it's almost a regurgitation of, of their general plan at the time into our general plan as a city, um, since it was a requirement by state law. Now with the Eastville 2040 plan, we have a, a very unique opportunity of actually setting that vision now. And so what we would invite um, each commissioner to do is take a look at, at the list um, in front of you, which are some of the, the items that um, either through social media or common conversations or even the, the types of issues that we hear from our law enforcement and, 
and um, and first responders, um, some of the the main topics that are unique to ESIL. And I would invite uh, each commissioner to uh, look at the list, um, review it, and not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot. Um, each come up with your your number one topic. And from your number one topic, that'll collectively give us five topics that we would then um, go in and investigate and do technical studies and incorporate that into the Eastville 2040 plan. Um, so with that, I open it, uh, you know, that concludes staff's presentation. So we would open up for, um, you know, any questions that you may have and otherwise give it back to the chair for discussion. Okay. Well, um, I know each of my commissioners would like to uh, make a statement, but are you asking us to identify some things tonight? Cause uh, it's probably not a problem. Yeah. If you could, if you could just, you know, your, your hot topic, you know, item, um, you know, if we hear from others, you know, that in a, it's the same topic, then we know that that's something that's highly valued and, and we can look into that. So even if we walk away with three topics, um, but it's a strong three understanding that there's commonality on the commission that that's helpful as well. Okay. Um, I'm glad we're discussing this because some of this stuff overlaps with a list of topics we wanted to hear about and we briefed on a few months ago. Um, looking at this list, some of these, like uh, disaster terrorist preparedness, special events, agency coordination, floodings, seismic uh, seismic events, fire and rescue, law enforcement, all kind of roll into emergency management. Um, I'm curious, this is probably a question for Brian and Johnny, how many folks right now who work for the city are ICS trained, like three and 400, like NIMS and SIMS, and have we done any exercises and like the EOC with fire and the law enforcement? We actually have a, uh, most of city staff, I believe, is ICS 100 trained. And then a few of city staff have gone through the 300 and 400. I can have uh, Ava put together a list of exactly where we're at on that training. Um, and then I believe she has done one exercise in the last year. Yeah, I know your office is new, so it's impressive that you guys have done that so far. Um, especially right now with funding issues and everything else, getting those classes. But, uh, but yeah, I would, I think, uh, by continuing to build upon that and doing, you know, basically creating like a training plan to evolve our emergency management capabilities, you know, maybe eventually once we get a, uh, a substation or a city hall, actually create an EOC or, a um, some kind of command center and, and, uh, to be trained, but I think emergency management would take care of a good chunk of this list as number one for me. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to get the list. Uh, a top priority for me, and it's a big umbrella, is the law enforcement element. And we do, uh, you know, people want to feel safe in their homes and safe in the community. And as long as we have a good support system for and, and make it a part of our plan for enhancing and assisting our law enforcement um, partners with Riverside Sheriff's Department. I mean, right now we contract through the Sheriff's Department, but it doesn't mean we can't help uh, help them with their mission. They don't stand alone in that. We work together as a community to help them accomplish that task. So it's a big, a big category, uh, but I think there's a lot of things that we can refine uh, when we move along uh, on that. And one of the, you know, one of my recommendations, I know a lot of my commissioners feel the same way, that having some type of substation here in the city would be a big bonus. And that um, goes right under that law enforcement category. Substation can do a lot of things, uh, not just keep the deputies in our city longer, but opportunities for booking, uh, opportunities for the public to come to our uh, station to get law enforcement services, to communicate with the law enforcement, to file reports, even to have meetings um, when needed. Um, for uh, community meetings or uh, other like cert training, things like that. There's a whole broad spectrum that can open up if we actually have uh, the venue and the location and the, and the, the like law, law enforcement point of contact. So that's a big area for me. And I know it almost looks like it could be the same category, but it's a very separate category, which is the crime and neighborhood watch because law enforcement, I think, speaks from to the, the government involvement where the neighborhood watch element 
crime neighborhood watch element really speaks to the public engagement side. And our uh, council members have done a great job along with uh, Don Benninger and putting together a very robust neighborhood watch system. I think that should be a part of the future plans as well because they've done a good job putting that infrastructure in. Um, it's been fantastic and I think it's been very helpful to our law enforcement partners, partners um, our sworn side. So I think keeping that as part of the plan uh, moving forward is important because we don't want to let it languish and fall apart because they've built a good system. Uh, but sometimes you need to support it and identify it specifically. And when we have that, it's something we can integrate and, and keep that communication piece between our community and law enforcement strong. And I think that helps because they're localized to areas, but getting that, that communication piece is, is a big, big, big element for me. Um, I agree with, with everything you just said. I was going to actually say crime and uh, neighborhood watch um, and goes along the line with the same thing with law enforcement, um, creating our own volunteer unit actually through the sheriff's department here in the city, as long with our own explorer post, I think would be amazing to have here, um, which again, also goes along the lines with having our own substation um, where they can meet up and you know have meetings and stuff like that but again to reiterate how important the neighborhood watches to this city i think it's such a valuable asset that we have and to continue along with that and work with them and they support law enforcement so much here and um it's just amazing to see the community we have um and i'd like to just see that continue on for the future All right, um, as far, yeah, I, I think he was reading my mind regarding the substation. I think every commissioner here is, uh, is, is, is on board with the, uh, I'm just going on a limb here with the substation idea, and I like her explorer um, idea as well. Uh, I had a question regarding airport operations and safety. I kind of have a little bit of expertise in that area. What is it exactly that you guys are talking about there? So, so right now, I mean, there's land use provisions that go into effect, and that's um, implemented and oversought by the county's authority through the Airport Land Use Commission. Some cities go beyond that. Um, so some cities can go in and put, and it kind of can tie, like, as you can see, a lot of these topics can tie back to each other. So sure. um, you could see, um, you know, uh, noise restrictions. For instance, that's a, the easier one to. So, City of Inglewood, even outside of the Airport Land Use Commission, may have specific noise um, noise abatement, pro noise yeah. abatement programs, yeah. either for retrofits or things of that nature. So, that could be like a a, a policy or or a goal that you put in that um, you know residential uh, properties in and around the Chino Airport, you know the in the interior. Uh, decibel reading is X. Uh, sure. Have yeah, we like, had an issue with any any of the because uh, we obviously we're on the approach end of, of Chino Airport. Yeah. So um, have we had any issues with noise complaints or noise abatement issues with here? You you hear it. Um, so even Ontario. Um, so even sometimes you get some of the flyover from Ontario, and even now as as um, San Bernardino ramps up their their operation, where I think we're we're part of the secondary flight path for that. So I think that that's more of uh, if I had to phrase it, it would be um, in addition to ALUC and then probably more localized goals and policies uh, rather than the, the broader FAA or, or county. Now, it is, it's kind of a question, I guess, for fire and rescue then in regards to airport operations and safety, being that we are on the approach end of, of chain airport in the event of an aircraft accident, do we train, uh, obviously airport fire trains with aircraft and the hazmat situation and whatnot do do you guys uh train with that as well and how to you know obviously deal with that and obviously to secure the scene for any accident investigation with the faa and the tsb so to to say we've trained with the faa that that answer is no not yet but okay. we can definitely do that uh, we have a phenomenal mutual aid relationship with our partners at chino valley and ontario sure. and we're working on uh, which which takes a little bit of time auto aid agreements 
So we can definitely enhance our training in that in that arena. Chief Jansen back there, I'm sure, is capturing a note there, and uh, that's definitely worthwhile training. Yeah, that's something I like to see in the future with with that because you know an event, the unlikely event, but it it can happen. Um, we don't want to be caught with you know not knowing like not knowing, but you know it, it's just a situation that's kind of rare that I would like to see um, us up on board with with dealing with that. Um, my other issue or something I like to see um, being worked or, or deal with in the future here because this is kind of unique to Eastville is the cannabis, cannabis grow houses. We've had a n- number a number of uh, grow houses in the city that seems to be pretty unique here and uh, Ontario, I believe as well on the local area. So, um, you know, maybe in the future, give me getting uh, funding for specific teams to, to work that um, effectively and efficiently. Cause you know, we got, we got two guys working numerous cases and they're, I'm sure their workload is pretty high. So that's something that um, I'd like to see, um, in the future, um, as far as code enforcement, you guys are doing an excellent job, and I can't, um, I'd have to think about stuff about that. So that's that's what I got for now. Looking over the list, uh, I know I see how Eastville is very unique, and how all of these um, different topics, Jason, kind of interlink with one another. And so I won't I won't repeat too much, but I do. I, do have the passion to, to assist in any way I can with that volunteer program. And I was wondering, I don't mean to put uh, Lieutenant Boyd on the spot right out of the get-go here, but with the volunteer program, um, I saw it somewhat advertised on social media for uh, at the Harupa, Harupa Station. Anywhere, I mean, even with the volunteer program, is there any way to minimize the training of going out to uh, Harupa by having an established uh, office here or something that we can utilize here? Um, for the volunteers to co- coordinate something here to get it going, because I think you'd have a better uh, presence of volunteers that were willing to help. And, and I know there's a lot of people out there on social media that are that are t- uh, talking, and I, th- I think this is a time for them to step up and, and help the city. I mean, I know with budget cuts, um, as well as the, the new proposal for the CSOs that might be uh, implemented here soon, and, um, just want to know how that candidate list candidate list is starting to apply. Well, that was one of the things that's on my list, Commissioner, was to look at that. Um, one of the things that's changed recently is that the at one point in time, you used to be able to have individual volunteers that, say, were assigned here to Eastvale. Somebody was assigned to Harupa Valley or Marina Valley or things like that. Now it's been brought under for training purposes under one umbrella under the complete – the Riverside Sheriff's Department has it. All the training and everything else like that is conducted at the Ben Clark Training Center, and they house – and train all the volunteers there. And then they get deployed out to their area. So if you have residents that want to be a participant in that program, yes, they can choose to come here to the city of Eastvale and and provide their services here. But the blanket is at the Ben Clark Training Center through the Sheriff's Department. So that may be the difference that you're seeing right now. We're trying to do social media pushes. One of the things that we did in uh, Lake Elsinore when I was down there, we really pushed the volunteer program and got that to uh, to bolster. COVID hasn't helped us much and it hasn't helped anybody really for that matter. But it is something that's definitely on my radar and I would like to, to ramp that up. Um, we definitely could have used them here a few weeks ago for sure. In, in regards to the uh, CSO program that uh, might be in budget here pretty soon? July 1st, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, sir. One thing I don't see on here that could possibly fall in the crime with me, it's a different category, is uh, homeless abatement. Because homeless is not a crime, so we can't put it under crime, but homelessness in California is going to get worse and not better. If anyone's been downtown recently, they're having outbreaks of typhus and all kinds of other health issues from uh, homeless encampments. And, you know, like 80% report co-occurring disorders of mental health and drug addiction. So, you know, we haven't really been hit by it yet, but it's only going to come here eventually. So I would like to see some type of aggressive homeless abatement and uh, some type of program working with the health department, fire, mental health, and law enforcement to address that over, you know, the 2040 plan as it comes to our area so that we were don't get caught by surprise like LA County seems to be. Thank you for that. Um, so just, just to recap um, and, and commissioner to your point about homelessness. Um, 
So we actually are, there's, there's a series of elements and the video would have explained that a little bit, but there's a series of elements. So there's also going to be other opportunities beyond the safety element, the housing elements, another one um, where we do uh, specifically address homelessness and then the, the resources um, and procedures that go into to that. So there, there's the, the general plan is made up of, of a whole bunch of different um, elements and even sub chapters like environmental justice is like a sub chapter and all those together make up the, the Eastville 2040 plan. So that'll be something um, that we know. Um, thank you for the comment. We'll, we'll make sure that that is the area of focus. But just to recap um, and put it on the record. So uh, you guys, you guys did well. Uh, you, you stuck to five topics collectively. Um, and so I just want to recap. Uh, cannabis grow houses, uh, crime and neighborhood watch, emergency management, law enforcement, and air airport operations and safety. So we appreciate that. And um, as we move along um, the ESO 2040 process, we'll come back to this commission with some updates. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I know it's uh, these are big item topics that we discussed tonight, like big like uh, big categories. But what I hope is we, when we move forward with the 2040 plan, that we always look for opportunities where technology can help us get to those. And those that can come down to any of these areas. So um, there's a lot of technology out there available, whether it be for notification or help the law enforcement piece, or you know who knows what it could be. It be, could be just communication with our residents, um, like with the Everbridge system or something. But you know, whatever big category we look at, it's nice to be able to explore what opportunities in technology, even when it comes to law enforcement, because we contract through RSO and we can't control those costs. And it's not just numbers. If we can do something our own, like we did with our um, license plate reader program, which has been great. I like having it here, but it was a technology piece, cost controlled. We know what the amount is because it's by contract. Um, we don't necessarily have to depend on outside costs. So whenever we can use technology to uh, um, help us solve some of these uh, questions and when we move forward through 2040, I'd like to, you know, hopefully keep that in mind when we're when while we're planning. But thank you for the presentation. So let's see. That was item 7.1, safety visioning and discussion. Uh, thank you for that. Do we have anything else before we move on and completely close it? Yeah, do we have any uh, public comment from? Uh... We don't, but if anyone that's on the webinar has a public comment, if they can use the raise your hand feature, we'll wait a few seconds. Give them an opportunity to answer up. We'll fill in that space. And so, like, that's another thing. Ever since uh, we've been o over the last four months, we've been able to expand our reach a little bit and use the webinar function uh, to give the public opportunity to participate during these meetings. Which is which is great. So anytime we can reach out to the public and help them understand what we're doing here at the city better, uh, that's a positive. So um, okay, yeah. yeah, we do have one. Uh, we have Keith White. Give me one second. Keith, are you able to unmute yourself? Keith, can you try that again, please? Okay, so he actually went ahead and sent me his request. He said he is worried about panhandling, especially around Christmas time. Okay, well, I appreciate the comment. Um, 
like that can be added to the record. I mean, it was kind of covered a little bit with regard uh, to homelessness, but um, they're a little bit different because you can have a homeless and not necessarily panhandle, but uh, we always do see an uptick of that during the uh, holiday season. So uh, we'll make sure that's uh, something we can pay attention to as we move forward. And chair and commissioners, if I may, there is one uh, other item that could cross apply in several sections in our, in our general plan. And that has to do with uh, safe routes to schools. So I just wanted to add that one as well. That's one topic we will also explore. If not in this element, then there's two other elements that we could explore it in as well. Yeah, Safe Routes to School, that's a national program and it's uh, a good one, especially we have so many local schools, even in our uh, small town. So um, that's a good one to add as part of that conversation. Thank you. Do, Stephanie, do we have anybody else that we want to bring to the conversation? No, sir, we don't. Commissioners, anything else before we close this item? Okay, we'll move on to 7.2, where we will review the proposed priorities for community enhancement and safety code violations. Uh, this is a presentation is by Johnny Tafar, our, our enhancement and safety manager. Is that, uh, are you up on that? Thank you. Uh -huh. Commissioner uh, Dinko and uh, the commissioners. The, the uh, I'm just waiting for the PowerPoint to come up. The, Request that we're making tonight via this staff report is for you to review and comment on the proposed priorities of our code violations. So during certain times of the year, we have a lot more than other times of the year. And at times that we can have uh, more code violations than we have time to get to in the time period we have. So this triages those just during those times into three priority levels so that we can respond to the most important things first. And um, I'll go through and show you a little bit uh, some examples of of what we were proposing. So priority ones are attractive nuisances, grow houses, obviously illegal dumping, commercial vehicles, parked in residential, or anything that has an immediate health or life safety issue related to it or a hazard of some kind. Um, Marijuana grow houses, of course, are important that we get to those right away. It's also the sheriff's department is already there. They need us to respond right away. So it's part of the reason it's on a priority one. Commercial vehicles, similar that if you don't respond to them right away, they disappear and then uh, you, you're not able to educate that person on the fact that they're not allowed to park in residential. So uh, just some examples that we provided, not for every violation. My remote's not changing. There we go. So we would prioritize, this as a priority one uh, when we first get the call because we don't know if that uh, refrigerator can lock in some way so the child could get in there and get hurt. It's also blocking the sidewalk. Um, if that refrigerator, for instance, was up at the house and we could secure it, then it might fall into priority two. But the way it is right now, it would be a one. This is an attractive nuisance. Uh, it's hard to tell, but the, it has a screen door, but behind that, the door's wide open. The window's busted out. So homeless people can get in here. Kids can get in here. It creates all kinds of problems. So we'd, we'd make that a priority one. We would make this a priority one because it's in the street and at nighttime somebody could drive through there and run over that not even knowing it's there. But the conditions could change our, our view of that. So I use this example on purpose because if you're familiar with this area, it's actually behind a barricade. So then that would be a priority too at that point because no vehicles go into that area. And so we would work on getting the contractor to go out and clean it up as a priority too. Uh, this here is another example of what would likely be a priority one at first. It could change. But right now, somebody in a wheelchair or whatever might have to go out in the street to get around that. And so we'd want to get it removed as quickly as possible. Uh, same idea here. You know, you'd, you'd have to go all the way around that van to get past these things that are in the street. Uh, yeah, I don't think it, oh, well, yeah, next to it, yeah. I, I was looking at the other water. Yeah, um, indeed. <laughs> and then this is priority two items. Um, this is probably the bulk of where most of our code violations fall into, kind of the routine stuff that we're out there every day, the impact quality of life uh, pretty significantly, um, you know, outdoor storage of junk, public nuisances, uh, all, all the things that you see on there. Uh, trash containers, we've kind of bifurcated that issue. If they're out at the street, or overflowing and it's not trash day, we, we call it a priority two, but it falls on the priority three list if it's up at the house behind the corner. So we'll we'll show that in a minute. Here's some uh, examples of this. So this is junk in view that we call it a priority two. 
this one here could also be changed if we got out there and that little green bucket was full of oil. Then we might bump that up to a priority one uh, because we don't want, if it rains or it spills out into the right of way or whatever, we want to get on that right of way, uh, right away. Again, this is the trash can issue. If it's left out at the street and it's not trash day, we're going to call it a priority two. Uh, landscape issues are going to be in the priority two area. Again, quality of life things, another landscape, you know, overgrown weeds. And then here's our priority three things. And at the bottom, you'll see the trash uh, container. The third one up is the trash containers in public view, and we'll have a sample of that in a minute. Um, and, and sometimes the parking violations, um, rental property registration, home occupation, these are all very important things, and we want to respond to them as quickly as possible. They just don't impact the quality of life quite as much as the ones on the priority two list. Uh, Christmas light displays, for instance, you know, that uh, those aren't supposed to be up after 45 days. Um, this, uh, this demonstrates exterior lighting that is aiming on another property. That's a code violation and it would fall in priority three. Uh, these are the example of the trash cans I mentioned where they're up at the house around the corner. We, we do get complaints on those and respond to them, but we would let that fall into a priority three. Um, so any code violation could be moved up or down that scale based on what the officer sees when they get out there. Now, they're already there, so they're going to take action because they're already there. But when they do their follow-up, that new priority would set where they would at, – at what point they would do their follow-up. So that that's basically it. And then I um, – if you want to go back, we can talk about the each of the uh, lists and get your comments and input on it. Thank you. I imagine with the volume of calls uh, and requests for service you're getting, there has to be some system in which you prioritize them. Otherwise, you're going to be running around and not getting everything done that you want. So I appreciate that presentation. Do any of our commissioners have any questions on on this? I do have a question. Um, I was going to bring this up for a later time, but somebody brought up to me about people riding dirt bikes on what's supposed to be a closed trail. And uh, I'll let you the address later on, but would that be a priority to public nuisance? Um, I I believe it's a Riverside County code that you can't ride off road. I don't believe it's a city code, um, so we can still enforce that code. But I I think I, just off the top of my head, I would say that's probably a priority one because of the dust it's creating, the noise it's creating, and the potential for harm. We get out there and we find out it's a big, you know. 30 acre lot that's in an ag area, maybe we can lower the priority and figure out what to do at that point. What is generally the response time for like a priority one, two, or three? Thanks, great question. So if it's a priority one, we're gonna basically finish whatever call we're on and go to that call. So during working hours, we're gonna get there very quickly. It's gonna, it's gonna be next thing. Uh, priority two, we're gonna make uh, an effort to get to within two days, two business days, in, as long as we've got all the priority one things handled. So that's where that number could slip a little if we got a bunch of priority ones coming in. And then the same with priority three. We, we start working on those once we get all the ones and twos done. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I know there's several ways to contact you to the city, but what is the preferred? Is there a preferred way or, you know, a, a faster way for somebody to get a hold of we'll, you? We'll take the complaints any way we can get them, but okay. our preferred way is the app, the eCitizen app. Okay, perfect. Um, it's, 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 we're going to make improvements on it, but it still works for us really well with getting us all the information we need um, in a way that we, that we don't lose contact with the person reporting it. Um, sometimes we have questions and, and we don't know. Sometimes people report an example is, my neighbor's pool is green. We go out there and nobody's there. We can't just walk in the backyard. Yeah. So we need to reconnect with that reporting party to find out, well, how do you know? Is there a place we can look at it legally to find out and confirm that? So it really helps with that. And uh, that is our preferred method. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So, Johnny, looking at one of your slides there, the one trailer with the different uh, fluids, automotive fluids, you said if that uh, particular one was with oil or something like that and leaked down the driveway, that would be upgraded to a priority one? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I guess I'm just kind of getting back to the um, uh, citizen complaint a little bit on, on the one on Berry Hill with the antifreeze going down the driveway. I guess... You're looking, so how does that uh, go through eCitizen? Would that make an immediate response for an action, a priority one? Yeah, during the working hours that we're here, uh, if somebody reported that on eCitizen, as soon as an officer saw that on there, they would go out and respond to that. Yeah, because it's it's just my public, or 
just my point of view that if uh, that individual's washing it all down straight into the gutter, that uh, it's yeah. not a, not a good thing to and do. And we get public works involved, and there's a whole process that they go through for cleanup and making sure that if it made it into the storm system, that we we go back and clean that up. So there's there's a process in place for that. Okay. My other question was, I don't know if this falls into with code enforcement. What is the what is your explanation of uh, the people uh, uh, operating private uh, drones, personal drones in the air in the city of Eastville? It's regulated by the FAA. And so we, the city doesn't have any uh, jurisdiction, basically. Wow. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah, please. Commissioners, if I could add on to the antifreeze one, in addition to all the, the reporting to code enforcement, but as you know, antifreeze, that, that's a hazardous materials. And to be washed down the storm drain is an absolute unacceptable situation. That, that warrants a 911 call. So in addition to public works, please, um, and, and I get folks, okay, it's, they might think it's just antifreeze, but the environmental impacts, the potential life risk, if kids were to play in that, please encourage folks, call 911. That'll start a hazmat response with the battalion chief. Uh, hazmat and county health will come out and evaluate, uh, mitigate the situation, and then unfortunately, there'll be cost recovery that'll follow that. So if we could, you know, any type of hazardous unknown materials, if it's unknown, it's deemed hazard until it's identified. So if I just wanted to add on to that briefly, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, I appreciate sure. that and helps uh, bring some clarity to uh, how those things are ca categorized. So I appreciate it. And I just wanted to confirm you then you, the priorities we've established, you're, you're good with those. I think they look Mission. great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for explaining those too. It's good to have a visual. <laughs> so thank you again. We'll move on to our uh, section uh, um, eight on our public comments. Any member of the public may address the commission on items within the commission subject matter jurisdiction. Cha Chairman. Yep. So one? we actually do have a public comment for item 7.2 oh, and okay. then we do also have a 7.3. So. I can go ahead and read the public, if you want to open up the public comment portion, and then we have one more item. I okay, so should I go ahead and uh, read the uh, what I just started? No, no, no. If you go back to uh, 7.2. So we'll go back to 7.2 and uh, take uh, a comment from a member of the public? Okay. okay, we'll open up the public comment for item 7.2. And um, for those listening, this is for the proposed priorities for community enhancement and safety code violations. So we have one public comment from Keith White. Good evening, commissioners. Right by the child care center, by child care center near Swan Lake, there is always a trash can there and shopping carts, which is by the water canal, if in front of the child care center. End of public comment. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. We've, uh, we'll take a note of that and see what we can do to add that to the list of items for us to look into. So thank you, Mr. White, for sending that in. And I think we have something for 7.3, is that right? Actually, real quick, 7.2. Are these priorities listed on a website somewhere in case the citizens wonder, citizens it, wonder why it might take longer to fix the trash can as opposed to something else? Yeah, it is our intent to put them on the on the website so that people can find them. And then we also plan to, when you file a complaint on eCitizen, provide you a link to that. Website. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So we were planning to do that after we got your feedback and yeah. <laughs> got it. No, I think we're good. Um, on 7.3, we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a comment. For 7.3, we actually have a presentation. Okay. Um, oh, did I skip that? You did. Sir. Oh, I'm skipping a lot of items today. <laughs> All right. I, I appreciate you. Uh, keep an eye on that. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, Gina. So uh, item 7.3, we have the Systemic Safety Analysis Reporting Program, SSARP. This is provided uh, by Gina Gibson-Williams. Community Development Director. Sorry about that, Gina. Thank no you. worries. Chair and members of the commission, tonight, Kimley Horns Representative Daryl Depensier will be making that presentation, and some of you are familiar with him from the community workshop. So I will turn it over to Mr. Depensier. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, commissioners, for your time tonight. And uh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Dinko, I know you've seen some of this before and heard it, but uh, we'll just go through it really quick. Um, so the Systemic Safety Analysis Report is a program that Caltrans runs at the statewide level. The idea is the state gives out funding to local cities, counties to conduct these safety studies. And the whole purpose of this is to identify what traffic safety issues are most common locally here so that we can identify a toolbox of things that we can set up and have ready to go. So if we see a condition that we know is potentially contributing to vehicle crashes in the city, we can just go out and fix it without having to necessarily wait to have crashes and be responding to them in real time as they occur. So um, we go through a pretty rigorous process as we build these up. Um, it's a benefit cost analysis. We look at how much um, proven benefit based on research in the state and the um, federal government there is on the benefit to each of these different improvements we look at and how much they cost to implement so that we can compare them to what's going on here and figure out which ones are most cost effective for Eastvale to pursue as a systemic measure. Um, and it's part of an overall program, the Highway Safety Improvement Program at the statewide level is the program that uh, provides a lot of funding to build safety improvements. These plans are required to be eligible to actually apply for those grants and do some of the higher, more expensive safety improvements in the city. Um, so we have based this on a number of case studies. We looked at the crash data throughout the city. We identified some issues that seem to be more common in general. And then uh, on your screen, you can see a list of locations that we identified that were either higher in the quantities of crashes occurring there, or they had an unusual uh, balance of crashes for different um, crash types, a lot of rear ends or a lot of side swipes or things like that. And then areas where there was a lot of bicycle and pedestrian type crashes because those tend to involve a lot more injuries. And then we looked at injury levels and a number of other factors to select those locations. Um, and we work with the stakeholder group, including um, commission here to identify these areas. And then for each of these case studies, we went and looked more in detail at what the type of crashes are happening at those locations. We identified some potential improvements that could be done there and matched them up with the conditions that we saw to develop the toolbox that we'll talk about um, moving forward. So in turn, we've also conducted a couple of workshops with the stakeholder group. Um, a few things that we have brought up by the stakeholders to us to make sure we were including in this plan. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were looking at specific challenge areas, so things that matter here in the city. So school zones was one that came up, street racing, aggressive driving, and inconsistent speed limits. So we'll make sure those are all accounted for. We added a few locations to our, stake, our uh, study list. Um, the city has a good program of speed feedback signs. So when you're driving down the road, you know those ones that pop is how fast you're going relative to the speed limit. Those actually collect data as well on the speeds. So um, making better use of that speed data to understand where the speeds are, help with enforcement. And then in terms of enforcement, uh, it was noted that the city doesn't necessarily have a system yet in place to cite uh, freight violations on the freight routes for trucking and things. So that was something we might want to look at. And then to be a little bit more proactive with speed limit setting, make sure those are appropriate for the type of roadway and maybe set up the roadway to include, bring people down to the speeds that they need to be. Um, so in terms of toolbox items that we've identified through this process, um, I know this is a dense list and I'll try to explain what these things are um, if you're not sure. So the first one was intersection control evaluation. So um, if you're at an intersection, should it be a roundabout? Should there be a traffic signal there? There's a process that you can go through to identify which one of those controls is going to be best for safety, best for traffic flow, making sure speed goes through. It's a Caltrans adopted process. So where, where an intersection lights up with crash activity or anything else, that could trigger that intersection control evaluation process and lead you to a, a a good control option. Uh, install or enhance crosswalks. So intersections where there's either no crosswalk or just the basic double line crosswalk, we can um, enhance those, make them more visible with the continental style crosswalk, which is the those sort of vertical bars that you see, or the ones that are even more enhanced where you have the vertical bars with a little gap in the middle to make them really stand out. You have quite a number of those in the city already, but the uh, crosswalk design standard is a little bit um, inconsistent in the city right now. 
Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the stop signs that have the little LED red lights flashing around the perimeter. So some locations where we don't see great compliance with the stop signs, we can add those to make them more visible, increase the size of the signs. And then other signs, um, the yellow flashing beacons or other things, we can add them into places where we're not seeing things. Sidewalk and pathway lighting, that's obviously a one for nighttime places where we see um, visibility or a lot of pedestrian activity at night, making sure light, street lighting is aimed at the crosswalks and in the intersections so people are fully visible. Uh, establishing more bike, bike lanes and bike routes. So um, that can be striped bike lanes, that can be more significant improvements where we have actual separation between bike lanes and regular traffic or even off trail systems. And in places where you don't have room for that, there's other treatments you can do with the, the little Shero stencil. I don't know if you guys have seen that with the picture of the bike with the little two arrows that indicates a shared lane. Um, so there's, there's different ways we can indicate that separation for drivers. Um, Hawks and RRFBs, those are kind of industry terms, but uh, they're for pedestrians as well. So when pedestrians are crossing the road and you don't want to have a whole standard signal, you can put these up there. So the RRFB, you've seen that the pedestrian pushes a button and the little orange flashing lights come on and let people know that those are uh, pedestrians there. The Hawk is a little bit more aggressive. It's the one where you have the two red lights over top of the little ones. That's why they call it a Hawk because it looks like a bird face. Pedestrian pushes the button, turns red, stops traffic, then it goes to a flash so they can move with caution when the pedestrian clears. Um, and then we have the refuge islands. So um, particularly on your larger intersections where the pedestrian has to cross many lanes of traffic to get across. Sometimes um, older people might not be able to move as fast or people just might not make it. They want to run and that changes while they're in the middle of the intersection. So they have a place to stop safely in the middle of the intersection and wait for the next cycle. Um, Decorative enhancements, while that doesn't seem like an obvious safety improvement in certain places where you have really high speed traffic, those can help make the road just feel more urban. So people will tend to drive a little bit slower and a little more cautiously because they get that feeling that this isn't a freeway anymore, it's a neighborhood now. Uh, and then when you have uh, your turns at intersections where there's signals, what we call protected left turns, when you have the green arrow, so the opposing traffic is stopped for those left turns. That's another one, and there's several different levels of that that we can apply with the flashing yellow arrow, the solid green. We can um, make it so you have the left turn period, but then you have the one where you can go when it's clear um, after it runs over, or just the red left that makes it only possible when it's in that protected version. Uh, channelized turns. So in a few in places where you have, uh, like uh, that was particularly on Limonite, where you have the right turn pocket that kind of comes and goes along the right side um, and you have a lot of driveways into the businesses um, right out in front of City Hall is a good example. Uh, people could potentially just keep going straight through even though there's a right turn only and that may cause conflicts with traffic so if you put an actual structure in there to force them to turn right when they have to turn right that can uh, minimize that. Um, another one visibility improvement for signals so uh, sig when you look at a traffic signal and you sort of see the black um, halo around it and then the signal heads you can actually put the yellow reflective one on so at nighttime those stand out a lot better you can make the heads a little bit bigger you can use LED lights in it lots of different tricks to make them stand out a little bit more so if somebody's not paying attention they'll see it a little bit more easily um, Another one's pedestrian ramps so uh, particularly if you think about Archibald and uh, Schleisman Road you've got the, a single pedestrian ramp that applies for both directions. So that's not very great for ADA, people with visibility issues, it kind of just directs them right out in the middle of the intersection. So if you separate that out of two ramps that are directional, you can make the intersection geometry a little bit better and a little bit more friendly. Uh, we already talked about the speed feedback signs. Um, leading intervals is another one that's uh, a bit more unusual. That's uh, where the signal is set to allow the pedestrians to go before the vehicular traffic. So the pedestrian is already in the intersection when they get the green light. So you don't have that problem where the vehicle just goes right as soon as they're even looking and flips the pedestrian that's trying to get into the into the road. And vehicle detection is another one that's a bit more of a technology-oriented thing where uh, the signal has the ability to actually detect oncoming vehicles and can avoid turning yellow at that critical moment when the driver doesn't know if they're going to stop or go, um, which often leads to rear-end collisions. So based on that, um, 
if uh, the commission has any thoughts or any toolbox items they would like to consider or weren't too fond of on that list, we'd be glad to hear about it. Thank you for the presentation. I mean, we <clears throat> this is the first time uh, this commission's had an opportunity to see the, the list of intersections uh, for them to review and maybe submit um, opinions, but uh, you gave a, a list of possible toolbox box options, uh, which are great. All, the, all those we can use to help solve some of these problems. And I know during um, some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the meetings that we've had, some of the rec we had preloaded recommendations uh, from your group, which I thought were pretty good, especially uh, some of those recommendations that came down to visibility. And we had a, a couple um, stakeholders had some really good feedback on some things that maybe I wouldn't have thought of. You know, I, I think of like in one direction where um, they already had some uh, background and uh, road design and safety that maybe I didn't. So having a, a broad group to look at that, I think was helpful. But do any of our commissioners have any points they want to bring up with regard to these intersections? I was looking at these uh, like potential designs at the end. The Schleisman Road, Scholar Way to Hamner. That's uh, like just north of the high school, right? Or you want this roundabout? I believe so, yes. Um, so the elementary school there, the middle school there, there's a lot of kids that uh, that walk. And if the plan is to put stop signs on all sides of the roundabout, wouldn't the cars constantly be turning around there, disrupt all those kids trying to walk through as opposed to a crosswalk? Um, not necessarily. It depends on the design. So we didn't try to actually design anything for this, and that would be part of that ICE study I talked about, the intersection control evaluation. So roundabout design is actually, there's quite a few designs that are very effective for making it actually a lot safer for pedestrians and bicycles to cross the intersection. Um, it does require a little bit more space than your four-way stop does, but if you have that space, um, it can be quite effective and really minimize that conflict. Okay, it's probably something I've just never seen before, so I'll have to wait till you uh, put the design out. Thank you. Yes, and, and Chair and members of the Commission, also remember we had the two uh, workshops, so we wanted to be able to share with you some of the ideas that came from the workshop. We have not reached any uh, decisions, et cetera, that will lie in the hands of those who have been appointed and elected for the city, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly we need your feedback. So if uh, if there are thoughts that you have about any particular intersection and or a list from the toolbox, but uh, please rest assured we've made no uh, decisions. And on that note, this program, actually, that's not the point of the systemic safety analysis report. We're not defining projects or creating any um, solid recommendations of what we're going to do at any given location. However, the Highway Safety Improvement Program, which is also live right now, is a funding opportunity for the city to pursue uh, to develop some of some of the projects of the type that are listed in this study. So um, that will be running throughout the summer and um, is a good opportunity to put things forward that you might want to see happen. In your, the toolbox here, is there anything in there for the high, uh, you know, like Lamanite and Hamner, Archibald, those are all pretty high speed areas. Um, was anything talked about in regards to those um, they're almost like a radar that that will obviously produce the speed, but I I, I also seen them with uh, with a flashing like LED or uh, like a strobe light, if you will, to kind of get their attention, like hey, uh, you're going a little faster, there, buddy. So is that something that's that you guys have talked about? It's in here that I'm just missing, or uh, something maybe we can we, we can add. We have that in a couple locations. We didn't necessarily put it on every location where it might be applicable, but the city is actually working on a program of the speed feedback right now. So um, I believe there is quite a list of locations that they're going to trial to install those. So you'll use the you, you'll use the data from those radars, obviously, and then um, the other aspect of it is kind of just alerting the driver himself, saying, you know, when you got that flashing light, like, hey, you're going a little fast there, kind of thing. I know I've seen them before. Um, because uh, the car next to me is going past and got my attention. I'm like, well, was I going that fast? But that was a dude next to me. So, um, I, you know, I think they're they're good to have, and I think it'd be a good tool for us to, to use to uh, analyze you know, problem areas. They're good to have. The only caveat is you don't want to have them too much, because if they become something you see too frequently, then... I, I agree 100% on that, yes. 
On the uh, Cedar Creek and Schleisman potential design, what's happening there? I see like five different letters and exclamation points and like smiley faces and having a hard time. Uh, that was a that's a glitch on the okay. circum in the uh, yeah. So on our our systems that we have a different set of fonts that show that. So that's actually supposed to be a traffic signal, just showing that we could uh, okay, potentially fine. signalize that intersection. Thank you. And so one of the, uh, on that same one, Cedar Creek and Schleisman, I think some of the possible recommendations were like increasing the signage for visibility. Is that what's being indicated on there? Uh, that was probably part of the discussion that that was one of the options and that is part of the toolbox. So I, we don't have it listed here directly, but yeah. I just, I know in that specific area, because I live near this area. Um, if you go a little further down, that's, Schleisman and you go to Sumner and that traffic is backed up all the way, even like all the way till this proposed signal would be um, all the time. So I don't know if you take that into consideration when you're We do, up. but part of the backup is caused by the constraints on Schleisman because it narrows. So the when the property street. develops, mm -hmm. the street will be reconfigured to flow much better. So we don't necessarily want to put something extremely expensive to fix that problem right now because it's a temporary problem. But yes, the crash data also shows that there is an issue there. Um, and that is something that this toolbox is hopefully going to have some help, things to help with. Yeah. I just hate to see so many stop signals added because it already takes long enough to get out of our city. Um, so I understand that safety is top priority. However, um, maybe utilizing some of these other tools as opposed to stop signals. And and signals and stop signs are not safety mitigations. They are um, traffic control. So they, so you shouldn't necessarily be trying to use those only to improve safety. If you, there is usually another symptom involved that is better to tackle first. And maybe you do need that for safety, but it's, it's not something that you want to use for speed control and other things like that. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, the only comment I would submit uh, reference to these intersections is a possible proposal, even though this is not a final, were roundabouts. And I personally happen to be a big fan of roundabouts, but I also am concerned because I think it causes a lot of community um, questions and sometimes frustrations because they're not um, really um, not that frequent in, in California driving. So. Um, I, I like the idea. I'm really curious about the idea, but I just know as a city, if we end up, if that ends up making one of the final uh, decisions on something we might want to explore, I think as a city, we really need to do a good job explaining to our public how they operate and why it would be beneficial. So I, I'm really curious about that because I like the idea of keeping traffic moving, but um, I just, you know, if we get to the final stages of looking that down uh, in the future, I'd like to make sure that we're really good about educating the public and how that can still ensure the safety on Scholar Way with um, with the public. That's all. I like them. I'm just don't know if everybody likes them as much as I do. No, and that and that's actually something that's accounted for in that ICE process, the intersection control evaluation. Caltrans is well aware of the fact that the politics behind those aren't great, but the data has shown they are really good. So Caltrans is pretty supportive of studying those and definitely wants to make sure that public awareness is there as well so that they they don't get uh, shut down basically before they get a chance to go. Awesome. Commissioners, do we have any other thoughts or comments? I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the presentation and breakdown on this. And thank you for your time. Before I jump to public comments, I'm just going to make absolutely sure I didn't forget somebody in the room, Stephanie, because it was never intentional. No, sir, we don't have any public comments for 7.3. All right. And uh, our <clears throat> the time of the night for our general public comments for the night, I can go ahead and read it off for the record? Yes, sir. All right. Any member of the public may address the commission on items within the commission's subject matter jurisdiction, but which are not listed on the agenda during public comments. However, no action may be taken on matters that are not part of the posted agenda. We request comments made on the agenda 
be made at the time the item is considered and that comments be limited to three minutes per person. If you wish to submit a public comment, please aim, email the city clerk's office at cityclerk at eastvillca.gov. Staff will monitor emails to the best extent possible during the meeting and provide comments on possible, as possible during the meeting. All comments will be, mar will be made part of the record. Once public comment has been received via email, comments will then be read into the record with a maximum allowance of three minutes per individual comment. If a comment is received after the agenda item is heard, but before the close of the meeting, the comment will be included as part of the record of the meeting, but will not be read at the meeting. If you are joining using the GoToWebinar, raise your hand now and the clerk will call you when it's your turn. We'll wait a few seconds to find out if we have any one from the public requesting comment. Do we have anybody tonight either uh, in attendance or online? We're checking now. No, sir, we don't have anyone requesting to speak. Okay, thank you. That'll uh, close the public comment section and we'll move on to item nine, city staff report. Do we have one tonight? No, commissioners, we don't have any items at this time, uh, unless Mr. Jones has any items. There's none at this time. Oh, okay. okay. If you don't, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to compliment you on all of your guys' attire. I've never had a commission all come in in the uniform, so I, I, I appreciate the, the great look. You guys all look very dapper and beautiful. Uh, um, so uh, n nice job. Uh, not, you're not beautiful. She's, you're, you're dapper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I, I want to take a moment just to commend RSO for their work uh, in our city, as well as uh, their effort to make sure our city was safe and that we had peaceful protests in our community. They did a stellar job. Uh, uh, not every city or agency uh, um, was as successful as we were allowing demonstrators to have peaceful demonstrations um, and facilitate great conversations um, and so I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Boyd, all the other four or five lieutenants that were assigned to that. Uh, um, we had um, even an assistant or under sheriff here uh, at the command post. Uh, we had quite a bit of technology that was used to deploy. Our mayor was out there walking amongst uh, the protesters, engaging with them. Uh, we had shopping center business owners that were participating in it as well. Um, and some good things are going to come out of this, uh, and ESO will continue to be a shining light uh, where we uh, focus on inclusionary uh, and embracing the diversity that we have in our great community. And so we're going to be doing a lot of listening sessions, and more of that is going to come out in the future. Uh, um, but uh, um, um, we want to thank RSO uh, for the great work that they did um, in collaboration with us and keeping us uh, posted um, they've also been doing a lot of good work um, solving some of the, the incidences that happened after that are, that weren't correlated with it, but a lot of people in the community were thinking that they were, and, and, and that wasn't the case. And so, uh, um, uh, um, so um, I do want to share that. They also had a, an amazing uh, marijuana grow house bust. If you're not connected with the, the sheriff's department, uh, um, uh, they – um, are working really hard to get the head of the snake uh, because this is a big uh, uh, ring that's being run out of Los Angeles uh, that's coming out into the Inland Empire and preying on us. It's not just focused on Ontario and Eastvale. Every community in, in Inland Empire is dealing with this because we have big homes that are great for growing home uh, grow houses and a lot of our neighbors don't get out and know each other and so they don't realize when weird stuff is going on across the street or next door to them or that weird smell or why the electrical box is broken into um, so those are all things that, that I mean when people start putting up sheets and uh, newspapers on their windows and stuff like that that's not normal behavior uh, um, or when people just come into your house uh, uh, or come to a house at after 10 o'clock at night open up the garage go inside and you never meet your neighbors uh, that's why the Neighborhood Watch program is such a big program in our community, and we're working really closely with our RSO uh, uh, set team and our Marijuana Grow House bus team um, to um, eradicate that from our community, and we continue to appreciate people reporting those things. 
Um, but uh, just so you know, we don't go and bust them the same day that they get reported because we're also doing a number of investigations and we have to get a search warrant and all those kind of things. So uh, um, there, there's, a, there's a number of things that go into that. So when people report a marijuana grow house or a concern, you're not going to see uh, the wrath of RSO come down on that house in, within an hour. Um, so just um, as people uh, are aware of that. Um, you might see around the city, uh, the, the city council invested in some speed feedback signs and they are deployed around the city and there's a number of those around the community. And so uh, those things are not all stagnant. Those are mobile and dynamic. And so they will be shifting around so that we bring awareness to speed because uh, speed kills. Uh, and when you are distracted or making poor decisions or choices in our community, especially around our schools, uh, um, that impacts the safety of those individuals in our, our community. And so, um, and um, um, we appreciate people taking the patience to drive in and through and around our community. Uh, um, and I know uh, our community is only three miles by four miles. So if um, we, we're happy to help you get out of our community or in our community at a safe speed, um, but we don't need you driving faster than you can drive on the freeway in our community because that's not what our community is designed for. So um, uh, we, we and and Sergeant Gutierrez and his traffic enforcement unit will will make sure to remind you of that if you do that in our community, and they're doing a stellar job of traffic enforcement in our community. So I uh, um, appreciate that. And so. Um, I, I don't think we have anything else, but I just wanted to say thank you very much for all of your time and volunteering to serve on the Public Safety Commission. This is an important part. And um, as we do the Eastville 2040 plan, and I encourage you to go on and engage. In, uh, we have our new communication platform, Engage Eastville. If you haven't signed up for that, a lot of conversations like these that you had today are going to be taking place there. Um, and so I'm going to ask Jason and Gina uh, to send out that link uh, so that you can sign up and be part of that. Um, and, and, and lots of information is going to be out there. John, Johnny already sent it out. So. Okay, perfect. So, um, but if you can go on and watch that video, it was also put on our social media platforms, I believe, wasn't it? The, the general plan? Not yet? Okay. Okay. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're 10 years young as a city. Um, and so we have a lot of people that say, oh, well, this city's doing it. Well, the city's had a hundred years to get there. Uh, um, and and we're, 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 we're moving at light year speed. We also don't have to do everything they did because a lot of that's obsolete now. Um, so we don't have to go through all those learning, growing and pains. We can figure out what works here and what doesn't. Um, but one of the things that they identified is our general plan was pretty much for all intents and purposes, a cut and paste because of funding issues back uh, in the day from the county. And so now we have an opportunity as a city with a general plan to really identify what our community values and needs are in our community to make sure that we are the best community in Southern California, if not all of California, especially when it comes to public safety and community engagement and, and creating a, an inclusive community. And so through proper design. And so it all plays the integral woven web uh, uh, to do that. So just uh, uh, wanted to say that. And Yvonne, the, the Sliceman Sumner intersection will eventually be widened so that you're so that it doesn't take you an hour to get out of our community. Uh, um, uh, it's that one corner that the county never developed properly uh, um, when, when that whole area was subdivided. Uh, um, apparently, they said all the traffic was going to go west, and and that is not the case in Eastville. Uh, um, and so the traffic models by the the traffic engineers at the time uh, didn't fix that one corner, and they had the county had some provisions that you can't do off-site improvements on another site. Um, and, and so that, that's why that one southeast corner isn't fixed, um, but we are in the process. The other thing is, is the intersection of Walters and um, Hellman is going to be signalized and, and turned on very soon. And that will be at the site of the new Rondo Elementary. So if you're up and down Hellman, uh, be prepared. There's going to be a new traffic signal that's going to be red, yellow, and green, and red means stop, yellow means slow down for the stop, and green means you can go, um, just to remind everybody because that will be something new. And we will have law enforcement out there to remind you that red does mean stop. So uh, um, um, just wanted to uh, – we are excited that in collaboration with the Chino Public Works Department, Lewis Retail, 
um, and Rondo Elementary and our public works and community development team that we got that traffic signal installed prior to school starting. Um, that was a big push by the city council and our and our community development team to make sure that signal was in place so that when that school opens up that um, we have some kind of traffic control in front of that school. So um, that's in the southwest part of our community. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. I think that's it. Commissioner, can I just add one thing to the, for Brian? Brian, I just want to thank you as well, because I know you, um, I was out of state for the last meeting, but I did get back in time uh, on May 31st, that Sunday, when we did have to, um, a few people exercising their, their their voice, their opinions on some matters here in the in public. But thank you as well, and all the staff that were here at the command, command center helping out, and I was out there with the mayor. And, and Lieutenant Boyd and Sergeant Gutierrez, if you could, Please extend our thanks to the men and women that were out there for countless hours out there. Um, I saw firsthand their professionalism that they, uh, how they acted, and um, um, I just couldn't applaud them uh, anymore. It was just outstanding, standing stellar. Thank you. I, I know many of you work for different law enforcement agencies. However, I would say that our sheriff's department has been very, very professional in all these interactions, uh, one of the finest, uh, and um, they've helped a lot of other agencies out as well in these demonstrations. Um, and what, what I got to see at the command center, what the mayor saw firsthand over at the intersection uh, was a well-orchestrated, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, we only have four deputies in our t city at a time. I'm going to tell you that is not the case most days in our city. Uh, um, we often have somewhere between 15 and 24 personnel in our, our city on any given day. Um, but um, uh, the entire resources of RSO are available to us uh, as we saw uh, uh, with that. And they said, we will bring as many resources as we need to keep the city of Eastville safe during, and the protesters safe to do their first amendment, uh, uh, right to protest peacefully. Uh, the moment that looting destruction or violence occurs, uh, that will become a, an unlawful gathering and, and, and RSO will do take care of that. We had deputies responding from other protests that weren't as big as ours. Um, and it was really reassuring to watch 15 deputies come uh, code up up the 15 and get off and enter into our command center and say, where do we need to go? And then once our protests went, um, they got dispatched, uh, we dispatched about 30 or 45 uh, deputies to go help Hemet that was being overrun um, by um, some looters and some violence and destruction. And they took off uh, going code to Hemet. And so, um, but you can hear them all over the County um, and, Sheriff Chad Bianco uh, did a great job orchestrating and protecting our entire county uh, during these matters. Um, so I, I want to extend uh, the gratitude. And, and Cal Fire was there in case any fires or medical need was d done. And, and we had two engines standing on by um, because uh, with riding and looting, sometimes comes fires or uh, the deputies are out there and, and they, they might need to render a rescue or medical aid. So they were there to to assist as well as a very coordinated effort. So when we talk about uh, um, practicing emergency response, we were practicing it, uh, 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 emergency response. And we had the command center, we had two trailers, we had riot gear, we had everything uh, that, that you could possibly, and there was even a drone in the sky uh, um, uh, um, to keep a watchful eye. We could tell you what color uh, your eyes were if you had freckles uh, from 30, 300 feet up in the air. So it was pretty impressive to see the, the caliber of technology that RSO brought to that uh, that situation. Um, and you weren't a part of our uh, Public Safety Commission, but we did do emergency management plan that was adopted by the Public Safety Commission, and it's a pretty robust one. And we've been working to create the uh, the, the trainings for our staff um, uh, through that process. And we do have all the equipment to set up an emergency management system. We just don't have a, a building sitting vacant that we don't use 99% of the time. We either turn this room into it or the fire station, or we can move it over to the off ledge property where we also have a backup generation. We have all sorts of different opportunities where, depending on where uh, the incident happens and how long it's going to be in duration. So, um, and we've actually been running a kind of a emergency management wash program since COVID started. So, um, and, and we've been sharing information uh, with our agency partners as well as our council and community. So there's been a, a number of things that, you know, 
our COVID numbers uh, have jumped up a lot in the last couple of weeks, and it probably has a lot to do with Memorial Day, Mother's Day, uh, and Father's Day, where a lot of families gathered uh, and businesses starting to open up. But we are at 0.3% per- of our population that has tested positive. So uh, it's uh, one third of 1% in our community that has tested positive in our in our um, city. Uh, we are monitoring those things and working closely with the county uh, health department. Um, and, um, you know, we have opened up city hall for, uh, for public uh, to come in from eight to noon in the morning. Uh, but as you can see, we have sneeze guards put up in here. We have sneeze guards at the front counter. Uh, we're doing deep cleaning with our janitorial service. Uh, uh, the governor has required us to, to continue to wear masks uh, when not pra- able to pra- practice social distancing. Um, so we are, are, are doing that to the best of our abilities. Um, um, and uh, we are on an A shift and B shift for the most part with our staff. So Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then still teleworking so that we can create social distancing within our, with our organization. We also implemented a, uh, where you can make an appointment at the, at the, uh, counter, uh, through your phone. And so you can uh, go online or you can come up to the front door and you can just, uh, use your camera and it'll pull up and then you just insert it your information and, and you can get any information. We're trying to put more information out on the website. So if you're doing a building permit or whatnot, um, uh, that uh, you can get all the details and the specs and all the different requirements that you need to do so that um, it, it's right at your fingertips as a city. So Gina and the community development t- department are, and those are all safety procedures so that we don't have to have as much interaction if we don't need the interaction, uh, but we're always here at the city of Eastvale to serve our residents and businesses to the best of our ability because your success is our success and so is your safety. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. And uh, I'll just say my two cents real quick to uh, Riverside County Sheriff's Department. Um, again, I agree. Did a fantastic job in our city and really did a fantastic job in all the cities in which they service. We've seen a lot of cities across the nation have a difficult time, um, but we didn't. So I really appreciate that. I had a firsthand look at at the work they did, and I really appreciated the commitment in terms of personnel and dedication to keep everybody safe. So uh, thank you for me as well. So fantastic. Uh, And thank you, Brian, for the uh, city report. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, as far as commission communications, um, I'll ask any of our commission uh, commissioners if we have anything we want to add to the communication portion of the meeting. And with that, um, we're going to be at adjournment. So um, if we have no other additions from the commissioners, um, we will look to adjourn the meeting now at, let's see, what time is it? Seven. 40 p.m., the next meeting of the Public Safety Commission is scheduled for Tuesday, July 28th um, at 6 p.m. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.